Yes, it is. His truth is marching on. Elvis, I've said it before and I'll say it again, is one of maybe two or three genuinely cool people in my entire lifetime. Everyone else is just an imposter, just imposter, just pretending, including me sometimes. Elvis was just so cool. He was the king of rock and roll, that's what he was called, but he wasn't a fan of the title. He's quoted as saying, I can't accept this kingship thing because there's only, there's only one king. And his name is Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you very much. He, he, I'll stop, I promise. No more. Uh, no more Elvis. Well, a little bit. Of, <laughs> but beyond that, that's it. No, no more. And I don't care what you say. Oh, no, I won't. But Elvis wasn't... He, he was underneath it all a humble guy in his roots. This movie called Elvis, that was a big award-winning movie a couple of years ago, really does a nice job of diving into his history. The other reason he didn't want to be king of rock and roll is he deferred to others who came before him, who influenced him. He grew up in an African-American or at least mixed race community, heavily influenced by African-American worship styles as we have been here uh, and did so that, that really made him who he was. At one particular revival, uh, tent revival that came through his town where he went with a bunch of his friends, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and the movie picks up on that and grabs a scene on that and, and that's, where, that's where the shaking comes from. That's what he said. He says, I'm not, I'm not trying to like wow people with my, my moves. I'm just feeling the Spirit. It, God is moving through me in those moments and I don't mean to lift up Elvis as some perfect saint. We all know he was complicated but so am I, so are you. We, we all have strengths and weaknesses. We all have things about us that aren't always clicking on all cylinders. And that was certainly the case with Elvis. But the day he died, when they found him, he had a Bible uh, right there with him that he was reading. He was always hungry, hungry for God, hungry for a relationship with the king. There's only one king, it's not me, Elvis said famously. It's Jesus Christ. He's the one I worship. He's the king. And so on this Palm Sunday, we shout and we cry out, Hosanna, blessed is the king. That's what our Bible reading for today says. Blessed is the king of Israel. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Everybody get your palm branches. Let's, let's lean into this. Say, it's, I'll say Hosanna. You shout it back wherever you are, local site, campus. You're watching online somewhere. It, it's raining outside, so you didn't come to church today. because you're allergic to raindrops. And those things are nasty out there. They're, they're wet. And, and they can get you wet. And it's just, I do want to say thank you. I, I, I'm just having fun with you. Thank you for joining us online, wherever you are. But thanks to all of you who showed up, because this is a Jesus party. You didn't want to miss this. There's still a service at five. If it isn't raining at five, you might want to try that in person. Because we get to celebrate and we get to shout Hosanna. I'll say Hosanna, you shout it back. One, two, three, Hosanna! Hosanna! You're so good at that. You're, that was better than any of the other services. And I'm not just, I am just saying that. But it was really, really good. <laughs> Lutherans are sneaky Pentecostals sometimes, I think. You know, Pentecostals just start with, they're like, hey, everything, we can do whatever we would just throw it out there and, and scream and yell and shout and clap our hands and do the whole thing. Hope is kind of, you know, it, it tends or tilts that way a little bit, but, but Lutherans, even the most traditional Lutherans, have some of this stuff sneakily built in to the church calendar year, like Palm Sunday, where we get to say, Hosanna! Hosanna! Lena, Hosanna! Hosanna! It's just fun. Some of you are looking at me like, it is not fun, move on. <laughs> Hosanna! Hosanna! That's it. No more Elvis impressions. No more shouting, well, you can shout Hosanna anytime you want. Blessed is the king of Israel. Blessed is the king of all kings. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is in Philippians 2, where Jesus says, where the Bible says about Jesus, even though he, Jesus, is God and was God, he did not count equality with God as something to be grasped or bragged about. Or, or emphasized or, or proclaimed to the whole world. He wasn't the kind of leader who needed to stand up in front of people and say, look how great I am. Look, look at all the great things I've accomplished. Look what I've done. Look, look, look how superior I am. Look, look, look at me. And, and in that way, try to attract followers. That's it, all about the leader. Jesus was the opposite. He was a humble leader. Even though he, he, was, he was and is God. 
The fullness of God's deity dwells bodily in the person of Jesus Christ, the scriptures declare. Even though he's God, he did not count equality with God as something to, to, to be grasped. He, he didn't make a big deal out of that. He didn't deny it. And he ultimately said it when he was pushed. But he didn't make that the main point of his teaching or his ministry. Because he knew the way to actually change your life, to change my life for the better and forever, was to do so humbly. He did not count equality as something to be grasped, but instead he humbled himself, it goes on to say in Philippians 2, to the point of death, even a brutal crucifixion kind of death on a cross. This is Jesus. Behold, your humble king. Hosanna literally means God save us. Save us as the, the people are crying out. They want a, a, a king who's going to be the conquering king. And, and they hail him as that. They spread their garments, the, Matthew 21 says, on the road ahead of him, which is a symbol that you're in the presence of royalty. Here comes our new king. And, and, and all the details. It's like one thing after another this holy week. One holy thing leads to another. The dominoes start to fall. The dots start to connect. The pieces of the puzzle come together so we can see pictures that we could never see before. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. And on the surface, and there's nothing wrong with this surface. It's a true surface. It's an exuberant day. It's a glorious day. It's a day of celebration. It's a day of new life. The, the colors are green. It's a, it's a springtime kind of Palm Sunday celebration. And if that's what you came for, you came for the right reason. You came to give God praise. Hosanna means God save us and it means praise God. Hallelujah. That's what Hosanna means. Give God praise for he alone is worthy of our praise. This humble king. This humble king who didn't come to lord it over us in a way that is all about him, but came to serve us. He's a servant. He's a king who serves his kingdom. He's a king who loves his kingdom so much. And so all the, all the domino pieces, one holy thing leads to another. And I want to point you to some of that today, not just so that you can learn or relearn some of the historical connections between Palm Sunday and Holy Week and, and, and prophecies from the Old Testament that were made centuries before and how what Jesus is doing on Palm Sunday is not by accident. But every detail is plain. There's nothing random going on in this story. The palm branches aren't random. The donkey isn't random. The fact that it's Passover isn't random. Jesus knew, and, and, and it alludes to that in the Gospels. Even before Palm Sunday, Jesus sent a couple of his followers, his disciples ahead, and he said, go to this particular place. Here's the address. Here, I'll, I'll text you the coordinates so you, know, so you can have it. Go to this place, and I've prearranged for you to get a colt and a donkey's colt. Now, not, not, I'm a donkey and a colt of a donkey for me that I'll ride in on Palm Sunday. That's significant. But I don't just want to point you to how these facts aren't random, how they have historical significance. Even more than that, I want to make the historical connection for you so that you see there's something timeless going on here. There's something that God is doing in this Holy Week that starts with this Palm Sunday story in all four Gospels where Jesus rides this donkey down the down the valley of the Mount of Olives into the, it's called the Kidron Valley, and then up the incline. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, you've seen this, and you know it's the perfect natural amphitheater for a massive party and celebration that you could see from all sorts of angles for miles away. So what's happening is this spontaneous parade breaks out, and it's a celebration, and it's a party. And there's palm branches, and there's people putting cloaks down on the road for Jesus, treating him like royalty that he is, and calling him king, and shouting out, praise God for you, and save us, save us from our national enemies, save us from, from the occupation of the Roman Empire, save us from the ruthless legalism of the religious leaders of our day, the chief priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees, save us, God, bring like King David did a thousand years before you, bring that kind of a kingdom, defeat our national enemies so that we can rise to prominence and victory, that's why the crowd came out for Jesus. 
And there's nothing random about it. It's Passover and Jesus knows because he knows Jerusalem will be more crowded than any other time all year long. Passover is the highest holy day still to this day in the Jewish calendar. It's the time in Jesus' day where everybody who could, who had the means, would gather in Jerusalem to celebrate this highest holy days. These highest holy days, uh, uh, several days in a row called the Passover festival. Why didn't they do it in their hometowns? Didn't they have their own local synagogues? They did, but there was one central house of worship, and it was in the holy city of Jerusalem. It's where the Holy of Holies was, the Ark of the Covenant, in a special room that was so special only according to Old Testament teaching, one priest from one particular tribe would be sent in there as the designated atoner of sins for the whole nation of God's people. And he would atone for the sins, make a sacrifice once a year on the Day of Atonement. Inside that Holy of Holies is the Ten Commandments and the Ark of the Covenant. And it was believed this is where God resides. This is quite literally, physically, God's house. which is why everybody came to Jerusalem and Jesus knew it it's not any accident that he showed up at Passover time and you say well wouldn't it have been made more sense if he figured out a time to go when it wouldn't have been so crowded and maybe things could have turned out better for him and maybe the crowds wouldn't have turned on him the same crowd shouting Hosanna on Sunday will be shouting crucify him by Friday he knew all that Nothing random is happening here. God's in control of every single part, and Jesus is equal to God. Jesus is God, the Bible declares. But he's taking a knee. He's humbling himself. He's got, he's got people waving palm branches at him. It's Passover time, and he's riding in on a donkey. But it all has a connection. 150 years earlier, This artist's depiction of a guy named Judas Maccabeus, no relation to the Judas who's the disciple who betrayed Jesus. This is about 150 BC. He comes riding in down the same road that Jesus is taking on Palm Sunday 150 years later. It's not random. And it has everything to do with you. Connecting these historical dots is for the sake of realizing, oh, Jesus isn't just coming so the crowd can see him. Jesus is coming on the most crowded days of the year in Jerusalem because he wants to see them. He wants to see me and you. He wants to see us. He's coming for you. There are no accidents in this Holy Week story. And I would suggest to you that it's no accident that you're here today. Or at any church, it's not that it's this church, you could be at any church where you hear this good news and you start to realize this good news is for me. This isn't just a once upon a time story and yeah, that was fun and let's reenact it a little bit by shouting our Hosanna. This is a once upon a time story that's deeply rooted in history all the way back to the beginning and then timelessly it moves forward to right where you're sitting right now. You're not here by accident. God is in control of the details. Whether we recognize it or not doesn't change that fact. Doesn't change the fact that that, that God is God and we are not. This might be kind of fun. Wherever you are, turn to the person next to you and say, you're not God. Just go ahead and say, that's an important point to make, I think. Here comes your humble king, as opposed to Judas Maccabeus riding on a war horse. And it has everything to do with you. Jesus is coming because he wants to meet you here today. It's no accident you're here, not because Jesus wants to be seen by the crowd, but because he wants to get straight into your heart and your soul with God's life-changing presence and the power of his love. It's not that Judas Maccabeus did anything unfaithful, quite the opposite. He was a warrior victor like King David. He defeated national enemies of Israel when Israel was up against it. And so they celebrated it. As he came down that same road, they grabbed palm branches. It says in 1 Maccabees, the people entered Jerusalem with praise and palm branches. This is a historical book. It's called an apocryphal book, intertestamental book. Not in the Bible that that you have before you, but it doesn't mean that it isn't true. 
This is what happened. Judas Maccabees comes down this road and people grab palm branches to celebrate the victory. So it's not random that they're grabbing palm branches. They're doing it because they say, maybe this is our next Judas Maccabeus. Maybe Jesus is it. But Jesus isn't on a majestic war horse. He's on a humble donkey, which fits exactly according to the details that God is ordering and that he's bringing to you today on this Palm Sunday in this Holy Week. Look, he's humble, riding on a donkey, not a majestic war horse. You say, yeah, you know what? I'm more into this. This would be a better movie. This would be a better story. There's victory here. There's, there's wins here for us. It, this is the kind of leader you want to follow. The one who's going to destroy the enemies, the, the ruthless enemies of God's people. Look closer. Look closer and ask yourself this question, who's really got the power? Those who get praised as king by the world or the king of all kings who doesn't need a war horse to show how powerful he is? He'll wear a crown, but it'll be made of thorns. He'll go to a throne on this holy week, but it'll be a cross, not a seat lording over people. He's here to serve. He is the most unusual king and a, the most powerful king of all kings. He's the king that everybody bows down to worship. Though he is God, he does not count equality with God as something to be emphasized, to be grasped, but instead he humbles himself to the point of a death on a cross. Next verse, so that at the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess and every knee will bow and that day will come. When all the other forces of the universe, all the other powers, all the kings and queens, all of the leaders, all of the celebrities, maybe it's just me, but I don't really need another award show right now with movie stars or, or musicians or celebrities telling me they're saving the world with their art. I mean, I'm a big fan of art and, and music and, and movies and, and, and talent, and I love it, but get over yourself. You're not the Messiah. You're not here to save the world. Your acting in that movie isn't going to save the world. They, no, it wasn't just me. It was, thank you, Mom. I appreciate that. Yeah. I wasn't doing that for applause. And it's not the main point here. It is to say this. This is the bigger point. Neither am I. I'm not a big deal. You're not a big deal. You say, easy there, cowboy. I'm CEO of my company. I've made it to the top. Do you, do you know my accomplishments? Do you, know what I've, do you know what I do for a living? Do you know I'm at the top of government circles? Do you know I have influence? Do you know I'm TikTok famous? Do you know, do you know how many people follow me? Do you know how popular I am at school? Don't, don't, isn't, that what, what, isn't that what life is all about? Look closer. You see, that's the invitation of Holy Week. It's not my logic and wisdom. I'm just pointing you to what scripture reveals, to what Jesus is doing, to the lack of randomness of all these things. I'm not a big deal and neither are you. In fact, this will be really fun for some of you. Turn to the person next to you, wherever you are, and say, you're not that big of a deal, really, you're, you're not. <laughs> you're like, well, I'm glad I came to Hope today for the self-esteem boost. <laughs> oh, you're about to get one, because now I want you to turn back to that person and say, you are a beloved child of God. That's what you are. There's your worth. When the king of all kings who is God comes and says, I'm here to serve you. I'm here to live and die and rise from the dead for you. I'm here to ride a humble donkey, not a, not a, a majestic war horse. I'm not here to defeat your national enemies. With all due respect, I got bigger fish to fry, Jesus is saying. I'm here to defeat enemies that you can't defeat no matter what your title, what your status, what your income, what, what, what your power base in this world from a worldly perspective. I'm here as the king of all kings, the one who is above you, to take a knee below you, to serve you, and to give you the life your soul has always longed for. It's right here. It's right here with this king of all kings who comes riding into Jerusalem to remind us, I am that big of a deal. I am the Messiah. But I'm here to die for you. 
I'm here to sacrifice my life so that you can have your death destroyed. I'm here to forgive all your sins. I'm here to, to, to conquer the darkness of evil for you. I'm here to overcome your fears. I'm here to breathe new life into you now, not just eternal life later. I'm here to give you a hope that lasts. I'm here to give you a joy that can't be touched. I'm here to give you a peace that passes all human understanding. So that at the name of this king of all kings, eventually every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is king above all kings, that we were wasting our time putting anything above him. What does Jesus say central to his teaching in the Gospels? He says, because I love you, I need to tell you, you're seeking the wrong things first. Seek me first. Seek me and the kingdom of God first. My righteousness. Then all these other things will be that will ultimately bow down before me, will be given to you as well. If you're faithful in a little, Jesus says, I'll give you more. But it's not the more the way the world sees it. It's more mission. It's more purpose. It, it, it's more contentment. It's more satisfaction despite your circumstances. It isn't, a, it, it isn't a genie in a bottle granting all our wishes. It's the God of creation and salvation showing up for us in the person of Jesus Christ, the King of all kings. And sometimes I think we underestimate him a lot. Sometimes I think we try to tack on Jesus to the big things we're doing in our lives, to the big goals, to the really important stuff. And oh yeah, Jesus, we'd love for you to come along too. Maybe you can help us get there. That would be great. We're, I mean, we're happy to be here in God's house. We come joyfully laughing all the way down the aisle. Thanks for doing that right on cue. Thanks for, for catching that. <laughs> Here comes your king. He's humble, riding on a donkey, which isn't random. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 says, look closer. If you really want to know who the Messiah is, the Savior, the one who's got all the power, look for the one who's riding on a donkey. A little more detail. On the colt of a donkey. So said God through the prophet Zechariah centuries before Jesus was ever born. Here comes your king. Here comes your savior. Here comes your Messiah. Accept no substitutes. Put nothing above him. Some of you already know this. Maybe some of you don't. The big cross we have outside here at our church building in West Des Moines that stands above, that rises above all the rest of this church building. So when you drive by, you say, oh, this is a, the idea is we're sending out the message that this church is centered in the cross of Jesus Christ. Even more than that, our architect is a longtime member of this church, and so he says, well, let's put some more meaning into it. And so we got together and thought about it and came up with this. So from the, from the ground of, 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 the, of the atrium that's right out there with all the windows, and it's kind of like a spiritual lighthouse, from the ground of the floor that's at the center of this church building where we gather as a community, and you go straight up, there's a cross. And from the ground to the top of the cross, it's exactly 70 feet high to the fraction of an inch, 70 feet high, and the horizontal beam of the cross is exactly seven feet wide. And if you don't believe me, feel free to measure it this afternoon. <laughs> 70 feet by seven feet. When Jesus in the Gospels was asked by his followers, how many times do I have to forgive somebody who's done me wrong? And they suggested to Jesus, would seven do it? Seems like a lot. Seven's a number for fulfillment and completion and perfection even in the Bible. Wouldn't seven times be good? And Jesus says, well, that's maybe what religious people tell you, but no, I say to you, you must forgive 70 times seven. So some of you are like, oh, God, 490 times. You did the math, right? No, 70 times seven is symbolic for we can never stop offering grace to people who do us wrong. Because our God never stops offering his amazing grace for us. So when you drive by this church and you see the cross, you remember that biblical teaching. God's grace for me. God's grace through me. That's what it means to live a Christ-centered life. To know that I'm loved. I'm a beloved child of God. Even if I'm not that big of a deal as far as those things that are really going to last forever. And my titles and my money and all the things that I'm living for now will all fade but I'll still have a relationship with this Jesus. And I'll still have new and everlasting life. 
and I'll still be in his kingdom. Seek first this kingdom. Then all the other things will be added unto you. So the cross outside is painted white to symbolize, which in the Bible symbolizes biblical purity. And then the other beams that are around there, there's three beams. If you look at them closely, they're not pure white. They're like us. We're complicated. We're all a mix of good and bad, right and wrong, if we're going to be honest, in need of God's amazing grace. So each of those other beams are the other things that we could live for, the other kings that we declare the queens, the things that we think are the most important things to live for, notice that they're all at an angle starting to bow down to the cross of Jesus Christ. That at the, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So many things that might seem random aren't. <laughs> There's deeper meaning to all this stuff. There's deeper meaning to every detail. If you're reading something in the Holy Week stories this week, and I encourage you to read the Holy Week stories in the Gospels this week, if you're reading something you're like, I wonder if that's random, the answer is almost assuredly no. That it has some deeper meaning, some connection to the past. Here comes Jesus riding on a donkey to say to the world, I am the Messiah you're looking for. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the humble king. You don't need a warrior to defeat your national enemies. You need a savior to defeat the enemies that will keep coming after you and me for the rest of our eternal lives. And I've got you covered. I've got you. So the people are shouting praises to Jesus, but they don't even know how great he is. And sometimes we don't either because we underestimate him. It's Passover. In the central story of the Old Testament, which you've heard me preach many times, they take the blood of the sacrificial lamb, the faithful people of God, paint it on the doorposts of their house so the angel of death will pass over. And the most powerful king, the Pharaoh, on the face of the earth in Moses' day, who says, why would I worship your God? I don't know who your God is. I can't see your God. Sound familiar? Sounds like a lot of the skeptics in our world today. If I can't see him, I, I don't believe in him, why would I follow him? I don't see any power in your, if your God's so great, tell him to make it stop raining. He's not a genie in a bottle. He's not a circus act. A little more reverence to the God who is the one who loves us so much that he sent his son to be the king of all kings for us and the savior of us. And it's no accident that I'm here and you're here today to hear this good news, to hear it retold or maybe told for the first time to us. So God sends the angel of death to show the king who the real king is, the Pharaoh who's got the real power. And he passes over, that angel of death passes over the homes of the faithful who make their offering to God and paint the blood on the doorposts of their home. So here comes Jesus this Holy Week. He takes the meal from that Passover meal during the, the highest holy day of the year for them. And he says, oh, how I've longed to have this meal with you. He takes the bread and he says, New Testament, New Covenant, New Deal. This now is my body, which I am going to sacrifice for you tomorrow. He takes the wine of the Passover meal. He says, this is my blood, which I'm going to shed for you tomorrow for the forgiveness of all your sins. He's coming for you, this Jesus. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming down to be baptized in the Jordan River, John the Baptist had quite a following himself. But John was faithful and humble enough to know, eternally speaking, I'm not that big of a deal. I have a lot of followers. I'm YouTube famous. People are talking about me everywhere but it's not gonna last. The thing that's gonna last is coming down the pathway to be baptized in the Jordan River right now. And so he says to his followers, stop following me, follow him now. I'm the warm up act. And the way he says it is, look, behold, the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice who sheds his blood and it's painted on the doorposts of Jerusalem, this holy city that Jesus and his followers are entering on this Palm Sunday. That's not random either. It's Passover. It's a, it's a donkey. It's a donkey's colt. It's palm branches. It's the king of all kings. It, it, it's, it, it's just this time. And here comes the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world so that we take his blood upon ourselves and it's painted onto the doorposts of our souls so that death passes us over. And now all of the dots are starting 
starting to connect. All the dominoes, one holy thing leads to another. And it's all coming together. But it's not just all coming together historically between the Old Testament and Jesus. Let it come together for you this week. Because this timeless truth is breaking into right where you and I are living right now. Here comes your king. Your king. Not just their king. Not just Israel's king once upon a time. The rest of the New Testament makes that abundantly clear. Here comes the king of all kings for all nations. Not just one. Here he comes. And he's knocking on the door of your heart. Let him in. There's so much more. I, I could easily and I would enjoy preaching all day long on all the connecting points. I, I, I just love this stuff. I do, I, we got Bible studies. You, you can find out more about this. Dive in. But at the minimum, at the minimum... Keep worshiping and keep praising this King of Kings this week so that you are brought into his presence. As you praise him, you're brought into his presence. As you're in his presence, you discover and experience the power of God to transform your life. And that leads to the peace that passes all human understanding. Just briefly, the tension is growing between the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and Jesus. So much so that Jesus' disciples say, Jesus, we got to get out of here. And and they talk him into leaving Jerusalem several months before Palm Sunday. But then Jesus tells them, we got to go back. We got to go back. It's time to go back. I've got a mission to fulfill. And they say, you can't go. Caiaphas, the leader of the chief priest, the the head Pharisee, has, has put a price on your head. He famously said, better that one man, Jesus, should die than our whole nation should perish. What he really means is, I'm going to lose control. I'm going to lose power. Everybody's following Jesus and not us anymore. But he didn't know how prophetically true his words were. Better that one man, Jesus, should die than a whole world, not just a nation, should perish. Why does Jesus keep riding that donkey into Jerusalem when he knows where this road is going to lead? This is where the whole story comes straight to you and to me. He did it for you. He did it with you in mind because he's God like that. He knew who you would be before you were ever born. And he wants you to have a way of salvation a way to find hope again, to find this joy again, to find this peace again. He he wants you to have these gifts, this full and abundant life. He did it for you and there's nothing less will do. No other king can give you what the king of all kings can give you. No other king can give me what the king of all kings can give me. So he's willing to take on the threats of the Pharisees and Pontius Pilate, who represents the whole Roman Empire, and he'll go on trial before Pilate in just a few days, and he knows it. And it looks like Pilate has all the, uh, all the power. He represents Caesar. Who could be more powerful? The humble servant who stands before Pilate is way more powerful. Because what he brings lasts forever. What Pilate brings is just a historical blip on the radar. Who really has the power? And so who do you worship? Who is worthy of our praise? Who is worthy of our attention? Who comes first? Do you have the kind of faith that's first priority faith in Jesus Christ? Or is it first priority in my life is my passions, my, my things that I'm into, the stuff that I'm pursuing, my pursuits. And I just, if Jesus wants to come along for the ride, that'd be great. No wonder so many people in our world are wandering and struggling, even religious people, because we don't put the kingdom of the king of all kings first. And honestly, that just doesn't make any sense. The one who really has the power to give us what our souls long for, not just someday in heaven, now, so that even when the days get gloomy and and hard and difficult and challenging, we've got a foundation We've got a source, a wellspring of strength and hope and faith and love. The chapter before in John chapter 12, Jesus healed, healed, he resurrected his friend Lazarus. He came to the funeral in Bethany, which is just outside of Jerusalem. It's like the distance from Waukee to West Des Moines. He gets there and they're crying and they're upset. And Jesus is so moved by the tears of his friends and all the mourners at the funeral. He weeps. Where is God in our suffering? Weeping right alongside of us. 
And then he famously says, I'm the resurrection and the life which we engraved in the original Greek over by the cross, so we'll never forget it. He doesn't just say it, he backs it up. And he goes to the tomb where a mummified Lazarus, dead body has been laying for four days, and he has the audacity to say, Lazarus, I say to you, arise, you're dead, but I'm bringing you back to life. And the mummy walks out. And then Jesus does the coolest thing. I mean, Jesus is even cooler than Elvis, which kind of follows. What would you say if you said, dead man, come out of your tomb and don't be a mummy anymore. Come back and and live. And he did. What would you do? You'd be like, that's what I'm talking about, right? You'd be like, I just did that like it's hot. Yeah, that's me right there. I did that. I did that. Did you see that? You know what Jesus says? Unwrap him. Give him something to eat. Exit. That's just so Clint Eastwood cool in a Western, I don't even know what to say. do 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 -do. Because he's the king of all kings. He knows who he is. He knows death bows down to him. Now, who gets your highest praise again? Who's worthy of it? All the other things we give our attention to, can can they conquer death? Can they forgive all your sins, wipe them clean, give you a whole new slate? Can they destroy darkness with light? That's why there's so many people there. They heard about Jesus' arrival and they wanted to see this Lazarus that Jesus has raised from the dead. And it's all coming together. Every little piece of it. It starts on Palm Sunday. And as you watch this clip, for those of you who are visual learners of this Palm Sunday story, it's just a short little clip. I want you to watch for it now that you know some of the details aren't random. Look for the palms, look for the donkey, look for the Passover, look for the crowds, look for the enemies of Jesus, look for the tension, look for what he's walking into, and consider just how powerful and strong and committed to his mission your king of all kings is as he continues to press forward for you. He brought you here today, not just so you could see him, but so he could see you. So he could get into your heart. Here comes your king. We set out for Jerusalem. Thousands were heading there for the festival of Passover. Is he now? He's just entered the city on a donkey. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey. Where's he headed? Towards the temple. He must not interfere with Passover. happening right on time and for you. Jesus rides in on Palm Sunday and it's no accident. It's no accident you're here. He came to meet you today, not just for you to meet him, 
Follow him to the upper room on Monday, Thursday. Follow him to the cross on Good Friday. Follow him next week. I mean, I don't want to give away the plot of next week's sermon, but it's really good news. I mean, it's really it's such good news. We got 10 services here in this campus alone, making room for you and all your friends. If every member of Hope showed up for those services, we'd be about a third full. So invite your friend. We don't advertise. We don't put up billboards. We don't buy Facebook ads. We don't, we, we don't put the word out. We, we, we just invite. Invite people to come and meet the King of Kings. Invite people to come and find the life that our souls are longing for because one holy thing leads to another this week and another and another. And it connects deeply to the past and it goes straight into the present as we move toward the future. How far is the king that you give your life to or the queen or the priority? How far will your priority go to arrange all the details in your life to give you new and everlasting life? Does it have the potential? And even if it did, would it? Or is your king or queen really more about themselves than they are about you? How far will your king go to arrange all the details for you? My favorite scene in this Elvis movie is one that's kind of a quick hit, and you might have missed it. And I admit I look at movies kind of differently than most people. I'm looking for levels and stuff. And, and, and in this part of this movie, you discover that Elvis Presley isn't just this entertainer, this performer, but he's a brilliant leader. And this is historically true. If, if you dive into his biographies and what people said about him who were in his orchestra at his Vegas shows or who were his backup singers, and they all say, yeah, this is who he was. He, he was the guy who had a vision. He would see things for the show that nobody else would see. And in the scene you're about to watch, he's kind of laying all that out. He's kind of directing everybody's set steps. He's clearly the conductor. He's the king of rock and roll in this moment. And he has a vision for the show that nobody else has. And everybody is happy there to follow his vision. And that's great for the show and that's great for music. But this is a metaphor. I want you to watch this and understand I'm showing you a metaphor for the way Jesus directs your steps, wants to conduct your life, wants to tell you a little louder here, a little softer here, a little more this way, a little less that way. Watch the king as a metaphor for the king of all kings. Inviting you to be in a relationship with him that's so faithful and so deep you really do seek his kingdom first. And you let him direct your steps because when you do, man, the results are so much better. I, uh, I want to try something new. All right, Glenn, you're going to start us off, okay? Take the intro here. is at the end but I know what this is 
Did you catch that part? <laughs> Out in front of the crowd, he's like, okay, backup singers, you're so blessed, you're so talented. God has given you a gift, and now it's time for you to put it together the way we rehearsed. Right now. Right now. Right here. Not you trying to take over the part, but you blending your voice in in community with the other gifted singers around you. Okay, piano, I want this. Not that, I want, I want this. All right, all right, horns. All right, brass, here, no, kick it up an octave. Bring, can you imagine Elvis's shows if they were down an octave? Ba-da-ba, ba-da-ba, well, whatever. Turn the page, he had a vision. I would say, I don't want to push this too hard, but a God bless vision. He saw it. How far will your king go to arrange all the details for you? Here he comes. Follow him. Let's go now. This is the week. Don't miss this. Don't come in late. Don't, don't, I, don't, I don't mean you can't be late for a service. There's no such thing as late at hope. I mean, don't be late with Holy Week. Don't, don't wait. This is the week. Follow him now. Go. Dive into his word. Dive into scripture. Let him be Lord of your life. Seek first his kingdom. Then all these other things that are going to bow down anyway to his kingdom will be yours as well. Seek first. How far is your king willing to go to arrange all the details to give you new and everlasting life? Could another king even do it? Here comes your king. Look how far, look how far this king is willing to go for you. Look how, look to the cross. Look where he leads us. Look where this Palm Sunday parade goes. Look where it ultimately lands. Look where Jesus goes. And then, oh, but the story's not over. Well, I can't, I don't wanna like ruin the whole story. So we'll pick it up next week. It's a holy week. Don't miss it. Your king, the king of all kings is cueing you. Time to sing. Time to add your voice. Time to quit just observing Christianity and follow Christ. Time to let the one who brought you here so he could meet you, invite you in to the life your soul has been longing to live from the moment you were born. Don't get distracted. Follow the king of all kings, amen? Happy Holy Week, everybody. Come on, let's stand up and give God praise with this song. Here comes Jacob Herr, who, as God would have it, played the part of Elvis in our VBS skits the last couple of summers. So take us home, Jacob Thank Elvis. you so much for tuning in and joining us for Service Online. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We don't think it's any accident that you're here and we have been praying for you. To see more of our content, know when we go live and stay up to date week to week, feel free to subscribe to this channel. And if you live close by one of our campuses or local sites, we invite you to check us out in person. We would love to meet you. And don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date. See you next week.